Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to the realignment. Special greetings to the new subscribers we picked up since last week's episode of Peter Zion and Sagar and my big discussion episode on Friday. Really pumped that we brought in all you new people and that the discussion format we've added really works for everyone. Quick reminder, Tuesdays and Thursdays, this channel will feature interviews that are mostly podcast audio first, but we'll just post that video as well. And then on Fridays, that's really when we're going to do those discussion episodes, which we are increasingly going to make YouTube first and really dynamic, and interesting for folks. So pumped that you all are here and going to help us continue to grow as a actual YouTube channel. Today's conversation is with Stanford Law Professor Michelle Wild Anderson. She has a new book out. It's called The Fight to Save the Town, Reimagining Discarded America. It's all about local politics and local government. The show has been really more focused on the international stage, on the global economy, big decisions in DC. So it's great to take a break from all of that and focus on how local governments and actual local actors, foundations, activists, political parties are actually working to navigate a period where much like in 2008, you're going to see all these big budget crunches, which are going to really affect our lives at a really deep level, especially if you're in the sort of working class or poor rural or urban communities that Michelle's research focuses on. So once again, lots of great stuff here, but it's incredibly relevant to each and every one of us. Because once again, despite the news headlines, it's really the local politics, which is going to be so impactful on all of us. And frankly, is the one we all have the most chance to have an impact on. So hope you enjoy this interview and see you on Thursday and Friday. Michelle Wild Anderson, welcome to The Realignment. Hi, Marshall. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad you're glad you're here. I originally took this book because I think the topic is incredibly interesting. There's been this long running conversation about rural America, urban America, working class left behind. But considering your background when it's come to studying the aftermath of the Great Recession, I think this topic is even more pressing than just the general theme of the show for the past few years. So I, I just want to start with your with your background, considering the bleak economic picture. What did the Great Recession broadly do to the communities that you're discussing in the book and that we're talking about in this conversation? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And that's a, a question that's been on my mind a lot these days. I always have worked on really weak governments, governments that just can't provide basic public services. But then the Great Recession came along and created a whole new category of those governments because we saw the biggest wave of municipal bankruptcies since the Great Depression. And that period of years started emptying out local budgets in ways that I had never seen before outside of rural areas. So we started to see cities that had a profile of services that were reminiscent of what we'd see in um, in really low population rural areas. Um, so the Great Recession sort of put me on notice of what was happening in local governments at the bottom of the sort of um, at the bottom of the hierarchy of wealth in the country. And, um, and it got me looking much more closely at local finance. What does it even mean for a local government to go bankrupt or go into receivership? Because I think we probably think of governments and the towns they represent as being this thing. I live in Texas. Texas is Texas. Lake Oswego, Oregon, where I'm from is Lake Oswego, Oregon. How can that thing go bankrupt the way a company would? Great. Actually, I am so glad to get to define that because we use bankrupt in a general way to mean like broke, right? Like no more money. But bankrupt is a legal term. And of course, as you know, and like a company, a local government in some states can actually access bankruptcy court to work out its debts. And um, I say that it has to be permitted by states because under states have control over the question of what happens if a municipality runs out of money. Some states allow their local governments to go to bankruptcy court and try to rearrange their debts and put their creditors in a queue um, and, uh, you know, take other measures to sort of stabilize the crisis in court. Other states don't allow that. They have a state program, which is this word receivership that you use, that um, a state program that um, allows a state official to come in and try and work out the debts on the ground with the local um, officials. And then some states, including most of the South, 
don't do either. They just leave their local governments to sort of work it out and face their creditors in regular civil court one after another. So this question of like, what happens when a city goes broke, that is left up to state governments. I'm curious, because it's not inherently intuitive to me, why there be a geographic divide between states that allow local governments to go into bankruptcy or receivership and those that don't, because this is the definition of a local issue. So this doesn't seem to fall into like, oh, that's because of states' rights in the South before, you know, the civil rights movement. Why would that gap be there? You're right. It's not intuitive. And so I can't give you a sort of perfect explanation for why some states are in one category and others are in another. It's rooted in a mix of sort of historic practice and then I think a certain amount of politics. So if um, you know, the states that have leaner state governments in general, which includes a lot of the South, as you know, they, they don't tend to build out the bigger intervention programs that we see in the Midwest. The Midwest, like the Rust Belt, has been dealing with broke governments for a long time, and they had larger state governments that really tried to intervene to stabilize those finances. And in the South, there's been a lot of broke governments for a long time too, but they never sort of believed in or invested in that kind of state program. And then for bankruptcy court, there's a certain amount of politics because once a local government gets the shelter of bankruptcy, they uh, can break their contracts with their creditors. That's what bankruptcy court allows you to do. And so some states, um, you know, on behalf of various creditor interests have blocked their local governments from getting that specific form of relief. You know, and it's interesting. I think most people who listen to this show and who follow your sort of work are going to know that in the United States, there's been a changing relationship between let's say the role of the federal government and the way it conducts its economic and political affairs. So you have New Deal America, that's a different conception of the role of government than the pre-New Deal era. You have the post um, Great Society era. But when you're talking about how you have these local governments that post financial crisis, and even before the financial crisis, were struggling to deliver services, what would you say though, the broad history of local government services even was in this country, because I'm sure even, and I want to put this very lightly because like I'm coming from a position of not having to deal with this on any level. Um, even it seems to me a local government struggling after the 2008 financial crisis is going to probably provide more services than let's say a rural county in 1910. So how should we understand that history? Um, I thought about this so much. I love this question. Some days I thought that during the Great Recession, we were sort of rewinding the clock by a century. I thought, oh, wow, maybe we're back in the early 20th century. And then I, because the intensity of the poverty was so severe. And so it reminded me constantly of sort of this early era of American industry in which we had people sort of piled into our big industrial growth centers and they had really inadequate services related to water and sanitation and you know really basic fire control and so forth. And so I thought, is that where we're going? And you know, that comparison really doesn't work. The way I describe it in the book is that this feels like an echo of some of that, but it's not a repeat of it because we do have so much better technology. We have, you know, decades of investment in big infrastructure that we're sort of benefiting from today. Um, and so we don't have exactly the same problems. What's going on, I think, is that the intensification of the hardship is similar without it looking exactly the same way. And same in the 1960s. I mean, some days, especially working in Detroit and other Rust Belt cities, I thought, am I just writing the same thing that we could have written in the 1960s about quote unquote inner city decline? And there too, I thought, you know, no, I'm not because now we've been in that period of deindustrialization for 50 years. And so the 
kind of deindustrialized poverty that we're talking about is intergenerational. And the intensity of our drug crisis right now is, um, you know, specific to our times, and it's different than the kind of drug crises that we've weathered before. So here too, like I'm reminded of things that have happened before in American history, we're still living in the same land, but, you know, and we're accumulating some of these problems over time, but we are in our own phase of things. And the peaking of inequality, um, you know, that some people refer to as the second gilded age, the peaking of inequality is combining with the post great recession period, and is combining with the long tail of deindustrialization since, you know, really starting in the 40s, but um, all in the decades after that. And those three things are sort of um, combining into their own problem. So, you know, very specifically in the materials for the book that the publisher said ahead, it specifically says that you're not trying to write a eulogy or just lament the death of these rural and urban communities. Once again, not to be insensitive, something I do wonder though is what distinguishes a community that's been misserved? Let's say Baltimore, where the um, pipes are lead lined and there are just some basic things. Like Baltimore is it's a port city. There's all this opportunity there. There's just been some really bad systemic problems that need to be reformed. That's quite expensive. It's quite difficult, but that clearly is not something you could give up on. What's the difference between that situation, saying we're not going to write off that place, and a rural, a rural town that is hit by kind of this weird semi we're globalizing slash we're not globalizing era hit by the fact that we have seen people just move from the rural areas to the urban areas. How do we distinguish between places that need reforms and places that are actually are dying? It's such a deep question because I resist this word dying. And I, like you said, I resist this idea of eulogy or lament. You know, I think we've been doing that for a long time and I think it gives outsiders an excuse to walk away because we kind of naturalize decline as though it's this biological phenomenon or sort of destined because of the age of the city or something. Um, and cities don't work like that. You know, they don't have a life cycle where they just expire at year 100 or year 300 or year 5,000, right? We have ancient cities around the globe that have lived for millennia. So it um, land doesn't work like that. We invest in it, we rebuild it, we tear it down, it burns down, we sort of grow the city anew with new generations of people. And so that's kind of the base for this project is really thinking about the disinvestment in these places, what it looks like in our historical period today, and then what it would take to reinvest in the people that are there, not necessarily in the place, you know, your question implies rightly that some places are hard to quote unquote save, you know, it's like a word that I don't love in the, um, in the title, but I, um, but I own, it's, it's the right word for these purposes. But, um, but some places are, are not going to, you know, rebound to prior eras of prosperity. So the goal is something different. The goal to me, the goal of this whole project and all the people in it is how do you give people in that town choices about where to live and chances so that they can stay in town or they can move, um, but they're not trapped there by virtue of their poverty um, or um, experiences that they've suffered there. That doesn't even begin to get to the urban rural question that you asked, um, but we can come back to that later. <laughs> and something I'm curious about because once again, when we're telling this story, it's very, and I framed it this way on purpose, it's very rooted in this post-2008 period where this ever recurring debate in America about the words like personal responsibility comes into play. So a question would be, what do we as a society at the state, federal, municipal level owe to those individuals in these rural counties? Um, so I, I, I want to ask you that question, but one quick thing I would add that I think should shape how we think about this is 
right now we think of this like bailout or, or supporting measures being very about this urban rural divide bit here, very much about globalization and this like, you know, Detroit, Flint, Michigan, but you know, in the seventies, you, you know, this for sure, obviously, but New York um, was in a severe, severe, severe fiscal crisis. So this, and, and this whole debate about whether or not the federal government should give a bailout to New York when New York was making certain fiscal decisions. I think if you think about it from that perspective, there's a longer history than this just being about this 2008 crisis. So broadly speaking, I'll just re-ask the question succinctly. How should we think of what we owe to places? And then I'll get into the specifics after you give your answer. Yeah, I, your question captures the equilibrium that I really believe in politically, and I think is at the heart of this book, which is that outsiders have to care. They have to get their boots off the neck of these cities. So I think that's part of the command for outsiders is to stop creating this kind of headwind that, that really um, holds these places and their people back. But on the other hand, these problems can't all be solved by outsiders. And this ultimately is a book that front to back is stories of people looking out for each other in their own communities. So it is very deeply about local responsibility, mutual aid, a ferocious sense of loyalty to vulnerable people in one's community. And at some level, to me, that's, that's what reinvestment looks like. It's some kind of more functional, more competent um, partnership between outsiders kind of doing their part, including moving money. Um, and, uh, and then within the local government, um, sort of really uh, building out the institutions that are ready to receive money. There, I'll say one more thing about this, which I think is so important and I observed just over and over in reporting this book. In a place that has dealt with poverty for so long, there's a scrappy competition that sets up in town. It's just born of scarcity, right? Like everybody is like fighting for dollars. They're fighting to breathe. They're fighting for their institutions to survive. They're fighting against layoffs. Like everything is at stake all the time. And so there's a kind of dysfunctional level of competition that can set in in that in those conditions of scarcity. And it's a very stressful way to run institutions. And I think it deters people from getting involved in politics and local leadership because it's exhausting to be scrapping for dollars all the time and to be justifying cuts and so forth. Um, and so what I am really writing about in this book is this miraculous almost faith-based turn in local politics where people decide we have got to start working together because we are never going to build out single giant savior institutions that are going to fix all this. So, you know, there we've got six big organizations in the room. You do this piece, you do this piece, you do this piece. Like we're going to communicate constantly through text message at tables, like, allocating responsibility on big grants and we're going to start like rowing in the same direction and so yeah i mean at some level it's personal responsibility but it's also a version of kind of healing from that scrappy scarcity where people you know really start trusting each other again and and depending on each other i'm really curious about your use of the phrase boots off the neck of these communities because <laughs> it's an evocative one, but also, you know, once again, to the scope of your book, you're looking at a, you're looking at urban communities, you're looking at rural communities, you're looking at progressive ones, conservative ones, all those different bits. And, and to zoom in a bit, because, you know, I'm from, I'm from Oregon, like we should talk about, um, you know, Josephine County. I obviously don't come from that part of Oregon. So I'm not trying to like imply any like deep knowledge. I'm not sure I've even been there in my life. I'm from Portland, but that said, there's a lot of anti-government feeling in, in that community. So the conception of what the local government should do, the conception of what tax rates should be, I'm not quite sure that's someone putting 
the boot on one's neck, or maybe it's that meme where someone like puts the, um, the boot on their own, on their own self. Like people know what I'm talking about if they're on Twitter, but just, so just talk about this idea of like there being this boot, like what is the boot in these contexts? Yeah, it, the boot to me is an impossible set of circumstances. So when a state hands a local government an unworkable job, it has, you know, so, and I'll give you an example, actually from Missouri, it's, I did not write in depth about Missouri, but that phrase first came to mind in working on the St. Louis suburbs after the Ferguson, um, after the Ferguson protests over Michael Brown's murder and the larger um, reckoning that Missouri went through with what its local governments are asked to do. And they've got all kinds of constraints from the state level on how they raise money. So they have like handcuffs in 10 directions on how they bring in revenues. Then they've got handcuffs in 10 directions on the thing, or I should say mandates in 10 directions on the things they have to spend money on. And then they've got all this poverty just stacked in their town, which depletes the locally generated revenues. And then meanwhile, the state is not collecting pools of revenue at the state level and then redistributing them down to the brokest local governments. So they've got all this poverty, all these revenue constraints, all these spending mandates, and then you know, they're asked to kind of balance a budget. And what do they do? They balance their budget in the most horrible antagonistic way they could possibly have dreamed up. They'd sort of wring dollars out of the poorest people in Missouri's pockets constantly, sort of making poverty that much harder. They develop an elaborate kind of debtor's prison, et cetera, et cetera. So we get this terrible um, pathway that the local governments develop to quote unquote solve their problems. But you look at the situation and you just think like Missouri, that's where that phrase came to mind. Missouri had its boot on the neck of its poorest communities and the levels of income and racial segregation in Missouri set those communities up for an impossible job. And, um, yeah, so that's how I think about it. You know, you could, there's all these other forces that are just beating down on these local governments, including the opioid crisis, including the um, all kinds of uh, tax constraints at the state level that are constitutionalized, um, that, that constrain the collection of revenues at the state level, and thus the ability to support local governments locally. Um, so yeah, that's that's what, I, what I'm most worried about. Oregon is a good example where the, you know, voters in the 1990s established all of these constitutional rules about how local governments take in money that presumed that big timber would continue forever. I mean, they were built on the premise that local governments would keep taking in money through the harvest of old growth timber. But for all practical purposes, given the age of old growth forests, um, you know, they can't just regenerate quickly. It takes 75 years to build even like little sticks of dug fir trees. So as a practical matter, that's a non-renewable resource. And Ohio has been doing the same thing of like building out an entire tax structure at the state level that is based on the assumption that shale gas revenues will be there for the state forever. But, you know, hydraulic fracturing yields a finite amount of shale gas subject to market prices. So anyway, that was yeah. too long an answer, but it's, to me, it's such an important issue. No, it's, it's, a, it's a meaty answer and it's also the, the format. So feel free to go as, as long as you, as long as you need, as long as like, it's not a, I, I do 10 minute TV hits sometimes and it's really awful. So this is a much better format for this. So I'm glad you brought up like that post Ferguson moment, because this just gets to something I'm curious about. I'm very interested in once again, you're profiling people and movements. I'm interested in how local elected officials and activists respond to this increasing circumstance, which is just one of these forces that you're talking about, which is the hyper-nationalization of politics that plays itself out 
in local specific circumstances. So for example, I think it's, this, this, I think this would have been a much more partisan statement, but I think that over the past two years, it's more easy to say this in a nonpartisan manner. After um, June 2020, after George Floyd's death, like, there was a lot of talk about um, police reform, defund the police, also all sorts of those, those different policies you saw in Minneapolis specifically, like the, the local city council take like a very aggressive, aggressive stand that from my perspective, was clearly driven by that national conversation. What you then had over the following two years is that very aggressive stand be walked back in certain in certain respects. Because um, it seems to me what happened here, once again, not commenting on the specific policy stands that were taken, it's that you had this very local experience, like the, the literal death like on a city block be brought into this national multi-centuries long discourse, which I think it made it very difficult as a local politician, as a city council member to perfectly read the vibe to perfectly weigh and compete all these bits. So not just specifically to the BLM question, but I'm just curious, how, how do you think these local legislators are just thinking about these issues? Because even if you're talking about rural Oregon, when you're talking about the problems of rural Oregon, well, I say rural Oregon, I think of, I think of Trump. I think of Trump. Well, post-2016, what's one of the biggest divides in our politics? It's the urban-rural divide. Like, there, it, I'm having a real hard time finding any issue that can just be thought of like locally. So once again, the question is basically, how do you see local politicians trying to navigate this really difficult dynamic, no matter where they end up on the question? It's it's so true. I um, First of all, I would say that local politicians can't, just as you're implying, local politicians can't exit national politics. You know, they often are technically nonpartisan, but just as you said, they have a, a political reality to the politics of their constituents. They live in a particular historical moment with all kinds of political reality. Um, and so, you know, despite the technically nonpartisan nature of most local government elections, they still operate in this world of national politics. Having said that, Local governments also just have to show up for the real problems on the ground and meet them in real time. And usually I think that involves a certain amount of independence from the national questions. So in the context of policing, well, let me back up before I get to that and say one other thing, which is that in, in my book, I deliberately held four places together that have really different politics. So I have the anti-government, um, more right-wing, as you say, Trump dominant um, rural Oregon context. I have all the way to intensely blue Detroit with two cities that are blue, but sometimes purple and have like red streaks in them in the middle. So we've I've held that spectrum together on purpose in order to underscore that these kinds of places have similar challenges. And we can't pretend that the, you know, that all of these problems have a particular political color, just like we can't pretend that urban problems and rural problems are completely distinct phenomena that have nothing to do with each other. You know, at some level, the book is forcing us to hold these different kinds of people, these different kinds of problems and different kinds of politics sort of together under this larger rubric of our era and its challenges. When it comes to police, that was so important to me in this book because these local officials have to ask and answer their own questions about what they need and want from police. It's not my job to answer that question for them. I don't think it's the job of state officials either. I think local governments really have to think deeply with police leadership, with the general public, with voters about what they are asking law enforcement to do what things they really want and maybe need to take off of law enforcement's plate because it they can't, you know, we can't ask local government, we can't ask law enforcement to solve every problem of American poverty. I think most local governments agree with that at this point. Um, 
But Josephine is an example where, you know, the, the deep, deep cuts to law enforcement did not come from an abolitionist strand of strand of local politics. They came from the um, the urgent, sometimes desperate necessity of budget cuts that forced even law enforcement to take deep, deep cuts to their budget. So local governments are going to have to answer this stuff in different ways. And in Stockton, as a kind of purple city that I wrote about, you can see a sort of middle position in which people are thinking very um, systematically and with um, a deep connection to evidence from neuroscience and social science and um, public policy about how to do the anti-violence project better outside of policing. So just extraordinary forward thinking about bringing more parties, more institutions, more tactics to the table in slowing violence and in retaining and reforming police. So there's, you know, it's not an abolitionist city. It's a city that is really looking at how to change um, the structure of police. Um, and uh, um, so, and, you know, it's had a certain amount of political turbulence over that, you know, mayoral turnover related to voter opinions about whether that's working or not. Um, so anyway, bottom line is I think local governments have to bring those questions to ground and they have to work through answers. I'd like to, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the mayoral issue in Stockton because I want to, I want to talk about that because I think that's, that's, I think that at a, ge at a generational level. That's really interesting because I believe it was Mayor Mayor Tubbs um, in Stockton. He's this um, very ambitious um, young young politician um, who was mayor of the city until he lost re-election. He was very aggressive with, um, I believe, you know, reforms like UBI, those different policies. Yet he was you know, he's overturned. Could you just could you tell like I'd say like your interpretation of that story? It goes so many different directions. It's like very complicated, but I think it's a useful test case because a lot of look, he has a HBO documentary. So I think a lot of local politicians are very explicitly looking to him as a model um, for lessons, takeaways, those different bits. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll start with the premise that I've looked so closely at Stockton for many years. I've just um, uh, spent so much time on the city. And my honest opinion is that Michael Tubbs was the best mayor that Stockton has had in generations. So I will say that, you know, I say that as somebody who's never had anything to do with his campaigns. I have no reason to say that. I barely know him, but I honestly believe that to be the case. So then it begs this critical question of why he lost. And it that the answer to that question is so revealing about where we are in our local politics. Um, Voter information about how local government works is terrible. And because people really don't have a, because there's less public information. And frankly, like in California, just the collapse of like civics and how we, you know, K to 12 kind of education about how government works. People have ideas that local governments have the authority to do whatever they want. Local governments do not have, I'm saying this as a lawyer, local governments don't have the authority to do all the things we think they can do. And so part of what happened in Tubbs' case is that there started to be a lot of misinformation in town blaming Tubbs for things that were totally outside of his control. So you know, I, I could go on and on. It's a very long list of what were essentially kind of a combination of fake news and misinformation about things that were happening in City Hall that were totally outside of his control. Um, that's one part of it. Another part of it is that it goes to this HBO documentary. The, the fact that in a very, a, a city with that much poverty, fancy HBO, you know, film crews were going around town and this glitzy documentary about a rising star who's, you know, raising money from fancy philanthropists in Silicon Valley and flying to New York and so forth. This story started 
coursing through the city that Tubbs was out for Tubbs, not for Stockton anymore. That story, I, I get it. I, I get the impulse to sort of want a local person to really remain local. But the sad thing about that is that it misunderstands how much Stockton needed outside money and how good Tubbs was at bringing that money into town. And he brought in record-breaking levels of philanthropy that went to the kids in the public high schools, that went to um, uh, all kinds of investment in, um, in uh, youth in particular in the city. And that was private philanthropy, spending dollars in their own way. It's not going through the general fund. But there too, there was a certain amount of voter misinformation flying through town that, you know, for instance, Tubbs drew in this giant wave of philanthropy for a, a program for graduating high school students to get some money when they graduated and it only went to the kids in Stockton Unified School District. That school district doesn't have the same boundaries as the city of Stockton. And so there were some residents who were in a different school district who didn't benefit from that money. That's not in Tubbs's control. That's in the control of the private money that, you know, pass those dollars directly through to those kids. So yes, he has a lot of platform, he had a lot of power to shape the nature of those grants. And he definitely, for the first time, really focused on the most vulnerable people and neighborhoods in Stockton, to his credit. Um, but anyway, so that's my bigger concern is that it's hard just like it took me, you know, six sentences or whatever to answer that question for you, it's hard for Tubbs to like have his quick soundbite of, you know, everything he accomplished quickly in four years and the more elaborate um, explanations of, of uh, um, choices that were being made by outside donors. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, I um, I think he didn't get as long a run as I wish he'd had to sort of make that case to to voters. Yeah, and I think the like I said, because I was asking the question in a sense of learning opportunities for other young people who are thinking about that position. I think the upon reflection, I think everyone agrees the HBO documentary was once again, it went, that literally isn't what caused him to lose, but it was, it was a, it's an, it's an example. It's emblematic. And in most local places, the threat you're going to face is not that HBO is going to show up and loft you a little high towards the sun. So the Icarus syndrome dynamic is probably not that the, the, the Stockton story seems to me, it was just like the perfect confluence of so many different specific circumstances that just largely aren't going to happen in most cases. So there's a limit to what you can take from it. But I want to focus in for a second on, on you bringing up private philanthropy, because that's really interesting because um, something happened a, a, a few years back that really concerned me and I think gets to my concerns about innovation and forward movement, folks who are directing this vast amount of resources in a basically unaccountable, not, not, not that I think they should be like perfectly accountable, um, but I'm concerned that they don't have the right strategic or tactical approaches to navigate how complicated this political and cultural moment is. Um, the example I'm thinking of was the Oakland UBI experiment where you had a experiment where local private philanthropy it wasn't it wasn't this it wasn't the city it wasn't a politician they basically did a UBI program that only went to black residents of the city um, I'm sure there are all sorts of like very empirical arguments you can make about that. I'm sure you can make a reparations based argument. I'm sure that is actually the argument that's made. You can make all sorts of like tactical arguments about that. But I think anyone who's studied welfare politics in this country knows that the second that you insert, especially when people don't really have haven't made up their minds about an issue like UBI, the second you insert a very explicit racial dynamic you are going to mix up the politics. And then basically, and I've seen this ever since then, you've had that specific example be cited across the country when it's come to UBI politics. So I'm just curious how you, as someone who's studying these communities and are bringing up the existence of philanthropy, which can do what it wants. Um, I'm not advocating for a world where philanthropists can't put money into experimental programs, but I do want a world where I think foundation officers are more aware 
of political dynamics. Cause I just don't, I do not think the people who made that funding decision were aware of how toxic a dynamic that would insert into the debate. So how do you, how do you just think about how, it, there doesn't have to be a perfect answer, but how do you think about um, how folks should think about that in philanthropy? As government shrinks this question of what role philanthropy should have and how, how they can do their job well is critical. Because as you know, if philanthropy is to take government's place over really important public policy questions, then exactly as you say, it is going to have to be aware and engaged with the larger public conversation in ways that put a lot of pressure on it. So I couldn't agree more with that. And Stockton is a perfect example of exactly the same, or a very similar dynamic on the UBI front, where a tiny little UBI experiment, you know, in terms of the number of people that were actually covered by the the checks, gets um, deployed in Stockton, run, I mean, shepherded by Tubbs, definitely drawn there by Tubbs' leadership, but outside of his control, run by offsite philanthropy. And his reputation as a politician, his survival as a politician is tested based on people's larger political opinions about whether UBI is, you know, free money for people who don't want to work for it, quote unquote, or a kind of saving grace to stop gap unlivable wages, right? Lots of different ways of talking about what a UBI is, but Tubbs like ends up, you know, Anyway, I, as I saw Stockton chosen for that funding, I immediately regretted that philanthropy hadn't chosen a place where the leader was more politically secure. You know, UBI was good for Tubbs as a politician to sort of go forward and build his, his career on that social policy question. But, um, but it was not good for Stockton because in part Stockton lost a really good mayor over that decision. So it's a perfect example of exactly what you're describing. I think the best research, including from some of my colleagues at Stanford suggests that philanthropy should do exactly the work that you described. You use that really important word experiment. Philanthropy is really good at experimenting with things, you know, running smaller projects, figuring out, you know, things that worked well, things that didn't work well, using evidence-based practices to try to build programs intelligently. Um, So philanthropy is really good at that. And we we need a certain amount of that experimentation and iteration before we roll out giant government programs. So, you know, you want a certain amount of trial and error before you, you know, turn things into big bureaucratic entities. Um, uh, But, you know, once philanthropy starts really taking the place of essential government programs, um, it becomes really problematic. And Detroit is a a really good example of this, where the local government became so broke, it could no longer afford basic land use planning. And it needed land use planning because it was losing so much population. And when you lose all this population, you've got all this surplus land that you don't know what to do with, tons of blight, all kinds of inefficiencies and everything from water to 911 distribution. You know, they had giant government problems related to depopulation. Mm -hmm. And they needed somebody at the helm to say, like, what are we going to do with all this blight and land. And so in the absence of a government that had enough, you know, personnel to do that work, they brought in private or private philanthropy sort of stepped up to take that role. And the Kresge Foundation funded a larger private um, land use plan. And they did a heroic job under the circumstances. I mean, they really rolled out a public participation apparatus that's unlike anything that philanthropy has ever done, as far as I am aware. Um, And nonetheless, because it had not been, it was never accountable to voters. Over the long run, that plan couldn't, um, it couldn't retain its enforceability. Like it became a kind of Mm. 
dirty word in town that, you know, there's like this outsiders are telling us what to do and this larger sense of stress and anxiety, like some neighborhoods are going to be quote unquote unplugged from public services and who is in charge? This foundation that's in this rich town up the road. You know, that's not a good answer when it comes to sort of the street level politics of local government. So it was a perfect example where I think, you know, to this day, that plan remains incredibly influential, but you cannot speak its name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a sort of, you know, it has to operate sort of behind the scenes, local government and its rowdy, you know, sometimes messy politics had to be in charge in in order to give that any credibility locally. So last question before we get to the real sum up part of the episode in our last bit. I think defining a t two terms that are used interchangeably would be really, really helpful. So people hear progressive, conservative, they get that. They hear rural, urban, they get that. What is the difference between working class and poor in this conversation? Because you, you're not doing it, but I just know generally speaking, there's a, these terms are often used interchangeably, but I'm guessing from a research perspective, they actually mean very different things. Yeah, great. Um, I probably am using them somewhat interchangeably in this conversation, you know, just verbally, casually. In, in the book, I mean poor to mean um, at or around the poverty line, which, you know, the number, the 2020 numbers for the American poverty line are um, $26,246 per year for a family of four. That's our actual poverty line. So in the book, when I talk about a, um, a, a very high poverty place, I mean specifically a place in which at least one in five people live below that poverty line, mm -hmm. live, live below that 26,000 a year for a family of four. So that's the census designation. And that's, you know, sort of research often uses that to describe concentrated poverty, you know, one in five people living below that line. But, you know, in writing about all of these places, the, the phrase working class is so important because these are places where, you know, even with a relatively high unemployment rate, the vast, vast majority of people in town who are of age to work do. So these are working places. I mean, American poverty is a um, hardworking crowd. <laughs> and so these cities are full of people working really hard. I mean, I thought about that constantly in Lawrence because even though it has an unusually high unemployment rate for its state, there, um, there are so many people in town who are working, you know, 60, 80 hours a week, cobbling together multiple part-time jobs that add up to completely unlivable wages for that regional cost of living. And um, so, so yes, they're poor, but it's so important to emphasize um, how hard everybody is working to make a living. And the truth is that in low-income America, there's a lot of under the table employment. So even people that are officially classified as unemployed are you know, often scrapping out um, income through various um, occasional work, under the table work, temporary jobs, et cetera. So last few questions before we end this and throw people to follow up um, with, with the book. There's been this meta conversation since 2016 about this discarded, forgotten America. Um, if we're focusing on different time points, it's 2008, financial crisis, it's 2016 with Trump's election, insert COVID, and then 2022 with um, really the economic turn. How did you see the discourse around, let's no longer forget Americans in these sorts of communities, especially the rural ones, um, especially the wider ones, frankly, how has that changed this discourse or no, not, not the discourse, because this is the discourse. How has this changed the outcomes on the ground, if at all? Yeah, I mean, that is the, there's another way in which I really worked hard in this book to hold um, the, the different racial compositions of American poverty in the same conversation, which is increasingly hard. Actually, it's probably always been hard, but it feels especially hard right now. It's hard to have the same conversation about 
predominantly black Detroit as you're having about nearly all white rural Oregon. And I think some people will probably give me grief about trying to even do that in, in this book. They have really different histories. There's different headwinds that come with being Black Detroit that are very specific to the Black experience and the history of racism in, um, in uh, the sort of great migration towns of the, of the North. And, you know, with Detroit as what I think of as kind of the symbolic capital of the, the great migration flight out of Southern racism and trying to make it to opportunity in the North. And that, so that's a really specific history. And I tried to tell that history in depth and care sort of on Detroit's terms, not trying to compare it to anything else. Detroit is Detroit, Lawrence is Lawrence, Stockton is Stockton, Josephine is Josephine. And do that so that each place could sort of be itself and not be mashed together artificially with others. Having said that, it I stand so firmly behind the choice to put the four of them in the same book because I think sometimes we forget that there is a larger problem with poverty in America and that problem has all kinds of different racial compositions. Stockton is the most diverse country in America. Like it should be a famous, or did I say country? Excuse me, yeah. the, the most diverse city in America. It should be famous for that reason. You know, we should think specifically about the project of a multiracial country through cities like Stockton and Richmond, California, and these other places that are just breathtakingly global in their population. Um, we should think about the, um, the larger um, common ground and differences um, uh, based on the racial history of a place. So that was important to me. I think the book is an invitation for people to reflect on what is and isn't similar across these places. Um, and I hope I was, um, like I said, I hope I was very careful to never sort of create false equivalents among them. Um, but it's wrong to take from 2016 that only rural America, only rural white America had it bad. You know, we're in a particular moment of peak inequality right now. And that inequality, that intensity of spatially concentrated poverty has all kinds of different racial compositions. And I think we have to sort of start with that baseline reality. No, and I really appreciate you threading that needle here. Cause like, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a generalist. So I think of things more through more political, like broader lenses and to go to your point earlier about the scarcity issue. I think what folks who we should obviously talk about race, like we shouldn't just like wash everything away and act like it's the, you know, 1990s um, anymore, at least at a rhetorical level. But I think what folks who push the bounds of that issue under count is that racializing issues rhetorically can to the Oakland example, when inserted into scarce times, not produce anything that you're actually looking for. So the, 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 the real issue that I think people are going to run into, and it needs to, and once again, it's difficult. I'm a podcaster. I'm not expecting to have the perfect answer to it. But I think folks who designed the UBI in Oakland program should ask themselves, is the takeaway from that program several years later that UBI is this really great program that could affect local communities, or is it that UBI is a hyper-racialized issue that is going to be shut down in huge segments of the country because of that? So I think once again, like it's, it's not that either of us have this perfect answer to this, but it's just awareness of how scarcity politics during, once again, post-2008, post-2016, COVID, and then maybe we have a recession coming up. If you don't understand that tie together, um, it's, it's, it's really, really devastating. So I want to finish with this question then. So the story you tell is really rooted in the, I think in, in some tellings, you could root this story in the 70s with these tax revolts, with this specific response to the malaise and economic hardship of that era. Um, whether or not we go into a recession, the fact that we're talking about inflation, the fact that we're focused on gas prices means that we are literally encountering a history rhymes bit there. How should folks such as yourself, how should folks who really want to focus on these communities think about 
this real vibe shift. And what I really mean by that is it's one thing for us to have this conversation when it's 2018 and employment's great, the stock market is booming, everything, at least let's put aside like the political issues of the country. There's a period of, well, like we can expand and we can do big things. How should people think about what it's like to navigate this issue when the times look much more like 1978? Yeah, I I think the bottom line that I've learned in in reporting this book is that people have to bring their best work, whether times are flush or terrible, and that how we behave when times are terrible is to plant seeds for when an economy recovers, how we behave when things are flush is to plant seeds for when they're not. I mean, I'm talking to you from San Francisco. We are, you know, in our industrial heyday right now, sort of how we build, how we invest in people, how we invest in the next generation's education will be, um, you know, uh, those will be um, born out in decades to come if Silicon Valley slides back or if this industrial economy is replaced by the next one. So how we are today in our sort of good times is um, incredibly influential over how we'll be in the future. And this book was really, you know, was the most of the reporting for it took place 2016 to 2020 as the general economy thawed, but the um, recession was still hanging on in local Mm -hmm. government revenues. So for the most part, like at a national level, those were like good years, you know, for um, local governments. And yet you watch these places, um, you know, these in particular, and they're not the only ones, because they had done really good base building and repair when things were really bad, they were in a position, I think, to um, regain public trust and repair institutions when there was better cushion financially. So it, anyway, so I think we have to we have to really invest in in um, civil society, in mutual aid, in the connective tissue that we need to work together. You know, whether our economy is in the tank or or not. And then meanwhile, the last thing I'll say, you know, God forbid we should head into a catastrophic recession that really um, uh, presses that much more poverty down into um, individual households. But if we get there, I, I, I just express this from the heart in kind of clumsy ways, but American poverty is already so devastating. If we press another generation of violence and um, deprivation into um, poverty going into a new recession, I think we will be living with the consequences of that in America for a long time. You know, you cannot let that level of hardship, exposure to violence, you know, disinvestment in people's education, disinvestment in skills, you can't just let that kind of stack and stack and stack year after year. Um, So I hope that that's not where we are headed right now. Um, But uh, but I guess all I can say is like things are already pretty bad in places of concentrated poverty. Um, So if that's where we go, we're going to need some redistribution to soften the edges of that. Very well said. Um, Michelle, would love for you to just shout the book out um, as we close out and uh, really appreciated you coming on The Realignment. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, Those were amazing questions. Thanks, Thanks, Marshall. Thanks for joining us.